I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, praise the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. God is good. And all the time. Good morning, everyone. How was your night? Ah, God bless you. Nice to see you. I thank God for life. I thank Him for the honor He gives me to speak for Him. And while I have this platform, let me say in God's defense, God has never done me anything wrong. Never. All my blessings have come from God. All my problems I have brought on myself. Let me say it again. All my blessings have come from God. All my headaches, hardships, and hernia I have brought on myself. Are you with me? So God is innocent in my life. And I wanted to make that public statement. I love God. Ah, that amen is lifeless. I love God. Amen. I love Jesus. Amen. I love the Holy Ghost. I love the angels, Amen. and I love you. Amen. I love you, I said. Amen. Don't make me change my mind. <laughs> Our subject for this morning, Esau was a Seventh-day Adventist. What did I say? While I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. I told you yesterday, I'll repeat it today, it is an urgent request. When Peter stood on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, the Bible says, and Peter standing up with the eleven. That's very uh, meaningful to me. There were twelve disciples. Peter stood, the Bible says, with the twelve. Now, it was only the voice of Peter that was heard, but somehow those listening understood that the other 11 men were one with Peter in that sermon. And so in verse 37, the Bible says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? So while Peter physically spoke, the other 11 were one with him. When I speak this morning, I want to stand with the eleven. Can you say amen? amen? And so I ask you as a favor, ask God to put His words where? In my mouth. That's based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9. Then the Lord put forth His hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. It's also based on 2 Samuel 23 verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His word was in my tongue. And favor number three, what is that? I want you to think. I've often said, I'll say it now, if people would think, we would not do the things we do. If we would think, we would not drink the things we drink. If we would think, we would not eat the things we eat. If we would think, we would not date the people we date. If we would think, we would not, or let me change the, 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 the pronouns, if some people would think, they would not attend the churches they attend. Think. It is a divine quality. You serve a God who thinks. Here is what he says to you. Come now, let us do what? Reason together. Think. Let's pray. Be ready for those coming in to take their seats before we pray. So all is reverent. While I ask all men to take your hats off. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Our Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, when I say the name of Jesus Christ, I mean in the name of the one who is fully God, the one who said, let there be light, 
the one who said in his earthly sojourn, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Father, when I say in the name of Jesus, I mean in the name of the one who stood outside the empty tomb and said, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? In the name of Jesus, dear God, bless us with your spirit that he may enlighten our understanding. Grant to me, dear God, simple words. I humble myself before you, Father. My desire is your glory and the blessing of your people. For the sake of your glory, use me, dear God, please. And for those listening by television, even when they listen to this recorded version, bless them, dear God, with a revelation of saving truth. Thank you, dear God, for the high honor of speaking for you. It is an honor angels would love, but you've given it to a sinner such as I. I thank you, dear God, and may I always represent you aright in and out of the sacred desk. Now surround us with angels that excel in strength as we worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless everyone. Bless every family represented. Bless your remnant people, dear God. Bless the leaders of this country. Daniel 2.21 He changes the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. Not only our leaders, bless the leaders of the world, their father. Let them make decisions that are advantageous to the advancement of the gospel. I offer this prayer from my heart along with the request that you bless the sick. In Jesus' name and for his sake, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. What's our subject? Esau was a Seventh-day Adventist. Genesis 25, reading from verse 29. Genesis 25, reading from verse 29. I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible. The Bible says, And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. Verse 32, And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? Let's reread verse 32. And Esau said, listen to Esau's words, listen microscopically. Behold, I am at the point to die. That's physical. That's temporal. That's visible. What profit shall this birthright, that's eternal, that's invisible, that's spiritual. What is the profit of something eternal, invisible, and spiritual to me in a moment of physical need? Esau was so consumed by meeting his physical needs, his visible needs, his temporal needs, all of which are legitimate. But they so dominated his thinking that he lost sight of the value of that which benefits us now and in the life to come. What profit shall this birthright do to me? <clears throat> Verse 33, And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swear unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. One of the saddest verses in the Bible, Genesis 25, verse 34. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Finish the verse for me. 
Thus Esau did what? Despised his birthright. Some translations accounted it of little value, belittled, treated with contempt. Esau despised the most precious gift. A Hebrew boy, a descendant of Abraham, a male descendant could look forward to the birthright. A double portion of the father's wealth, headship of the family, the priest of the home. All of these and perhaps other blessings came with the birthright. Jacob understood the value of the birthright. Esau did not. And so Esau despised his birthright. I feel compelled to reread verse 32. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. That is called an extremity, an extreme situation. There are other extreme situations in which we find ourselves. Behold, I am 36 and I have no man. What profit is thou shalt not commit adultery due to me? Behold, I have five children, <coughs> divorced. My paycheck is small. What profit shall bring you all the tithe due to me? We value God's things in the light of our needs. Let me say that differently. We value God's uh, blessings when we, by looking through a secular lens. And we see no value. Let me offer a possible example. How many of you went on a 5K this morning? <clears throat> 5K, glad you survived. I don't see the point for running 5K, but go ahead. God bless you. <laughs> or 10K. How many of you were late because of the 5K to this service? Can I see your hand? All right. Okay, okay. Which one did you value more highly? Don't raise your hands. The 5K or the word worship that can change your life? You're in the final year of your PhD. <coughs> One exam to take to move into your uh, gathering of research materials. That exam is placed on the Sabbath. You are in Esau's predicament. What profit will the Sabbath be to me when I am staring down the loss of thousands of dollars invested in an education which I regard as the security for my future life. Do you see the profit in being a Seventh-day Adventist? Do you see the profit in serving God? Job 21, reading from verse 7, our subject, Esau was a Seventh-day Adventist. What was our subject yesterday morning? What? The morning before that. The morning before that. What book did I say? What chapter? Reading from what verse? What verse? Seven. Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, and mighty in power? Their seed is established in their sight with them and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull gendereth and faileth not. Their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. They send forth their little ones like a flock and their children dance. They take the timbrel and harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. Verse 13, they spend their days in wealth. 
and in a moment go down to the grave. Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. Read verse 15 with me nice and loud. If you have the King James Version, read with me. What is the Almighty that we should serve Him? And what profit, go on, should we have if we pray unto Him? There are Christians today, they go to church physically, but they do not see the profit in serving God. Anyone in that condition requires only the slight nudge to fall over and to leave God. A person of that description can never survive the time of trouble. My young friends, I ask you again, do you see the profit in serving God? Do you see the value of living a biblically upright life? Or are you so dazzled by the world that you are almost at the point of Esau to say, what profit is Seventh-day Adventism to me? And if it is of no profit to you, you will engage in no evangelism. We have a health message. Somebody say Amen. Listen to these words in Medical Ministry, page 49, paragraph 2. There are divinely instituted laws or rules which, if followed, will keep human beings from disease and premature death. <laughs> That's two immense, three, four, five. Listen again. There are divinely appointed rules. What does she mean by divinely appointed? What's the source? God. Can God go wrong? There are divinely appointed rules which if followed, what does if mean? Condition. Will keep human beings from disease and premature death. We have a health message that other people use for their benefit. You see, when you do things God's way, even if you're an atheist, you're blessed. Ah, I'm talking to myself. You're sleeping how with your eyes open? Listen again. If an atheist returns a tithe, he receives the tithe blessing. Because God is not a man that he should lie. We have a health message. We despise it. The way Esau despised his birthright. We have a message that would keep us out of hospitals. Keep our money in our pockets. Allow us to be fit to serve in foreign lands. Because the healthier you are, the more effective you can be for God. <coughs> God bless all sick people, don't misunderstand me. There's a strength coach who says, Strong people are harder to kill than weak people and are generally more useful. Do you know how many billions of dollars are lost because of sick days in this country? I say again, in the hearing of heaven and earth, we have a health message. But when that message is brought, it is despised. Get rid of those missionaries telling me that there's not to eat this and not to eat that and when to drink and when to sleep and get rid of them. They are disrupting our lifestyle. Don't tell me give up meat. God is not so narrow-minded as to care if I eat beef or pork or crocodiles. He is not that narrow-minded. Yes, he is. God is very narrow-minded. The soul that sinneth. We have a complementary source of wisdom. Huh? The writings of whom? Ellen White. 
God in heaven knows I speak the truth when I say how often I thank God for the ministry of Ellen White. Amen. Let me say it again. On my knees, I say it in the hearing of a God who hates lies. I thank God for what he did through that woman. Amen. And the legacy of light, the inheritance of truth that has come down to us. We despise it. Studies have shown that one of the factors that contribute to spiritual growth among Adventists is reading the writings of Ellen White. Let me talk to the young people. The older ones, it's harder to get through to them because we have more layers of sin, you see. You being young, God has just a little work to scrape away the sin, but for us, He needs a pneumatic drill. Read the writings of Ellen White. Cherish that wisdom. You got your eyes on a girlfriend? Read messages to young people. Read letters to young lovers. And read Adventist Home. You're thinking of having a, a getting married? Read Adventist Home. You want to bring a child into the world? Read Child Guidance. Not Joyce Meyer. And T.D. Jakes, and Benny Hinn, and uh, the others. You smile, and you smile beautifully, but do you understand the insult to God? Here is a, a source of inspired wisdom. And we despise it and seek carnal knowledge. No wonder... Nobody knows who Adventists are. As I was telling some people yesterday, all the whole world knows who is ISIS. Very few people know who Adventists are. We have a complementary. Why do I say complementary? Because it supports, it, it, it helps us to understand it in no way conflicts with biblical truth. We despise it. I was in a certain country on the face of the earth preaching a few years ago a weekend revival I stayed in the home of a minister who invited me I won't identify the country for fear of reprisals he told me the minister in his conference a letter was circulated among preachers which they had to sign I will not quote the writings of Ellen White from the pulpit He didn't sign it. And God bless him. The conference called him in. Why haven't you signed this document? He wanted to know why. Because one of the conference officials was a member of the local association of witches. Listen to a Bible verse. Don't go there, just listen. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Who can finish that? Believe what? His prophets, so shall ye prosper. Now, let's reread that microscopically. It says, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. It does not say believe in the prophets. It says believe them, which means believe what they say. But you believe in God. Are you following me? There's a difference. Ellen White is not a God. Ah, you missed it. It's my fault. Believe in the Lord your God. So shall you be established. Believe his prophets. So shall you prosper. This church officially regards Ellen Gould White as having exercised the biblical prophetic gift. As verily as Isaiah or Jeremiah, even though her writings are not part of the biblical canon, the source is the same. And when you neglect her light, you develop a disregard for this. 
And so I appeal to my handsome brothers, my attractive young sisters, listen to me. Do yourself a favor. Build on solid rock. Read the writings of the prophet. Amen. Buy her books. Every youth should have education. Every youth should have uh, messages to young people. Every youth should have principles of Christian education. Every young person should familiarize himself or herself with the Conflict of the Ages series. What are the books in the Conflict of the Ages series? Book number one, this row. Too slow. That row. That row. I want them in order. This row. No, that row. Let's start again. This is embarrassing. The whole universe is watching. The books of the Conflict of the Ages. Book number one in chronicle order. That row. This row. That row. This row. All together, the great controversy. Somebody say amen. You read those five books and you, 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 you educate yourselves in the essentials of what we call present truth. But like Esau, we despise our birthright. We despise the health message. We despise Ellen White. We despise the Sabbath. I'm glad you didn't say amen. Listen to me. We despise the Holy Ghost. We despise the divinity of Christ. I was in California several years ago, one of my favorite places, and I had just spoken and some man came to me, can I speak to you? And he virtually cornered me in a room, trying to convince me the Holy Ghost is not an intelligent personality. And I was, when he left, I said, Lord, why did I waste my time listening to that man? We despise the Trinity. We despise the concept of the remnant. We despise the concept or the teaching of victory over sin. We despise the two-phase ministry of Jesus Christ. We despise the investigative judgment. Esau despised his birthright. And so in my estimation, Esau, if he were alive today, would make a very excellent Seventh-day Adventist. Because that which God has given to us for our benefit. Now when I say we despise, it is not an organizational despising. It is not a vote taken, a majority vote, let's despise. No, no, it is just widespread in the church. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18, Paul says, While we look, not at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are what? Temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Listen to me carefully while you pursue your degrees. Oh, let me go to something else we despise. We despise our educational system. Well, let me not say educational system. We despise our truth about education. Because the system is often not what it should be. Education, page 13, paragraph 1, the servant of the Lord writes, Our ideas of education take too narrow and too low a range. There is need for a broader scope, a higher aim. True education means more than the pursuit of a certain course of study. It means more than a degree from Harvard. It means more than a preparation for the life that now is. It has to do with the whole being and with the whole period of existence possible to man. That is now and eternity. The Adventist idea of education is a preparation for eternity. Not to get a job at Walmart. It is the harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. 
It prepares the student for the joy of service in this life and for the higher joy of wider service in the life to come. Listen to the final statements microscopically. It prepares the student for the joy, keep that word in mind, of service in this world and for the higher joy of wider service. Now, if you have joy and service, then higher joy and wider service, where should your emphasis be? On higher joy and wider service. All intelligent people say amen. amen. Most of us, we pursue an education to get a job. This deafening silence confirms the accuracy of what I just said. Most young people, Adventists, pursue an education to get a job in this life. Is there any sin in a job? No. Who created work? God. Does work contribute to character? Yes. But listen to what they were doing when the flood came. Likewise, not the flood, the destruction of uh, Sodom, also the flood. Likewise also, Luke 17, 28, as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. Murder is not included. I'm sure it happened. Carjacking is not written. Burglary is not mentioned. Adultery not mentioned. Corruption not mentioned. Eat, God invented that. Drink, God invented that. Build, buy, sell, plant. You know what that is? Life as usual. How can someone be lost for living life as usual? Now, let me tell you quickly, am I telling you don't go to school? No, no, no. Christ's Object Lessons, page 316, paragraph 2, every act is judged by the motive. I love to ask young people, what are you studying? I'm studying uh, astrophysics. Why? Oh, I like math. Good. What are you studying? Chemistry, why? I like studying the periodic table. Okay. <laughs> what are you studying? History, why? I love to study the flaws in human nature. Okay. What are you studying? Uh, anatomy, why? I love the architectural design of the human body. The points of insertion, origin, the actions, and the whatever else. Okay. But what I'm listening for is, I am studying this or that because I see clearly how I can use it for the cause of God. I never hear that. Let me be extreme. As I continue to the close of Esau was a Seventh-day Adventist. Listen to a verse you know very well. Whether therefore ye eat, come on, or drink, come on, or whatsoever ye do. Let's look at that how? Microscopically. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, what does the word whatsoever exclude? Nothing. That verse is not in Revelation. It's not symbolic. You know, Ellen White counsels us Take the Bible how? As it reads. Unless, of course, it is obviously symbolic. Now, let's take 1 Corinthians 10.31 as it reads. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do. Do all. Question for you. When you chose Harvard, were you thinking of the glory of God? Don't answer me. When you entered into that relationship with that young man, young woman, were you motivated by the glory of God? Don't answer me. The fundamental motivation 
for the Christian is the glory of God. There's a quotation from Ellen White that I just love. It is the most powerful thing outside of the Bible. When I talk about the only motivation is God's glory, Desire of Ages, page 20, paragraph 2. There is nothing save the selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. No bird that cleaves the air, no animal that moves upon the ground, but ministers to some other life. There is no leaf of the forest or lowly blade of grass, but has its ministry. Every tree and shrub and leaf pours forth that element of life without which neither man nor animal could live. And man and animal in turn minister to the life of tree and shrub and leaf. The flowers breathe fragrance and unfold their beauty and blessing to the world. The sun sheds its light to gladden a thousand worlds. The ocean, itself the source of all our springs and fountains, receives the streams from every land but takes to give. The mists ascending from its bosom fall in showers to water the earth that it may bring forth and bud. The Desire of Ages, page 20, paragraph 2. Everything God created was created to serve something else. Extend that to us. Let us make man how? In our image. Therefore, you and I exist for the overriding purpose of the glory of God in everything we do. Let's not despise what God has given to us. My young people, let us not despise the church God raised up, not Ellen White, not James White. God bless them. And I, loved, I thank God for the ministry of Ellen White, I said that, and the, the pioneers. They did not raise up this church. Abraham didn't call himself. God called him. Ellen White writes, God has called his church in this day as he called ancient Israel. And so as he called Abraham, he called this church in the 1800s. God, Jesus Christ. Don't despise a privilege that God has given to no other people on the face of the earth. And that is to be the depositories of present truth. Don't despise the health message. Follow it. Don't despise the educational system. Encourage it. I'm not saying none of our youth should go to those schools. Yes, they go, but they go for the primary purpose of the glory of God. And trust God to make up any deficits that that may create, if any. And so today... I call upon you in the name of Jesus Christ. Regard the Word of God as your most precious possession. Revelation 19 verse 13, And he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. To treasure the Word is to treasure Christ. It is the Word that's the foundation of our health system. It is the Word that's the foundation of our educational system. It is the Word. I heard a story of an Adventist minister or a couple of ministers went to a Sunday preacher to ask him how he managed to build his church to those staggering proportions. I am told, I wasn't present, but I am told, the Sunday preacher reached into his shelf and pulled out evangelism and gave it to the Adventist preachers. They should have dropped dead from embarrassment. I've heard that some Adventists went to a man who ran a school to find out how do you run your school so effectively he reached onto his shelf and pulled out what book? Education. We must stop going to the Philistines to sharpen our axes.
I've heard some preachers say, why wouldn't you invite these Sunday preachers to your pulpit? Because the Bible says, come out of her, my people. Are you following me? God said, come out. Now, the Lord loves everybody. Come on, say amen. amen. Does he want Benny Hinn saved? Yes. Would he like to save the Pope? Yes. Would you like to save the Prime Minister of the Illuminati? Yes. <laughs> Would I have them in my pulpit? No. God bless T.D. Jakes. But if his life depended on it, he would not enter this pulpit. God bless Creflo Dollar. But even if his life depended upon it, he couldn't preach from my pulpit. God bless all Adventist preachers, but there's some I know that couldn't preach in my pulpit. Uh, let me be nice. <laughs> you look so depressed. <laughs> How many of you love Jesus? Raise your hand. Do you mean that? Stand up. Now, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment to Christ. How many of you will say, Father, as I stand where I stand, I recommit myself to my Savior Jesus Christ. Raise your right hand. Hands down. How many of you will say, Father, I recommit myself to present truth which no other church on the face of the earth has? Can I see your right hand? Hands down. Young men, young women, how many of you will say, as I make my choices in life, let me think first of the glory of God. Can I see your hand? Mm -hmm. God is delighted. Hands down. How many of you will say with me, as Paul lost his life, Peter lost his life, James lost his life, John the Baptist lost his life for the truth. I am willing to die for truth. Can I see your right hand? Keep your hand up as I pray. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, who said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He could say that because he laid down his life for us. Give us the spiritual decency, dear God, to be willing to lay down our lives for our Lord. But before we get to the point of laying down our lives, let us live our lives to support the educational system of this church. Let us live our lives to promote the health message of this church. Let us live our lives to popularize the writings of Ellen White. Ah, Father in heaven, give us a love for what you've given to us. Let us stop despising our birthright. In the name of Jesus, dear God, in the name of Jesus, ignite in us a love for the mission you've given to this church, which is to prepare the world for the second coming of Christ, as verily as the Jews were supposed to prepare the world for the first coming, and they did not. Let us not repeat that mistake. Father, bless everyone under the sound of my voice, but in a particular way, bless the young men and the young women, dear God. Let them go forth from this place as Bible-based Seventh-day Adventists. With holy pride in what God has given them. And then let the influence bring their friends to Jesus. Let not the opposite occur, dear God. Bless all the parents who sacrifice so much for these young people. Ah, God bless all of us, I pray. When you come into your kingdom, loving God, save us without losing one. Before that time comes, God, keep us faithful. Bless the leaders of this church at the general conference level. Bless Elder Wilson, dear God. His work is heavy. His enemies are many. Give him the wisdom to simply do what's right and let you deal with his enemies because you can deal with his enemies more destructively than he can. Father, bless every division president, every union president, 
every conference president, every mission president, station president, seal president, the leader of every hospital, every publishing that their decisions may move this movement forward that soon Jesus Christ may come to take us home. Hear this humble prayer to God. Forgive our sins. We offer it in Jesus' name and for His sake. Let all God's people say, Amen. Say it again. Amen. Say it again. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Remember what Jesus said. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Say, Father, you'll find it in me. God bless you. Travel safely. And may the Lord keep you under his care.